This morning, we want to present you the story of, of, of Christ's life. We're going to be seeing it through the eyes of a family. And while this family is really just here for the purpose of us seeing Christ, the stories that they're telling, the stories that they're showing to us, all are, ha are, are real things that happen in real life, just as you and I sit here. I hope you'll focus and you'll listen and hear the message of this cantata as we present Bread of Life. With my own ears, I heard him say that he was the bread of God. And then he said, I am the bread of life. I was puzzled. Who wouldn't be? What could a man possibly mean claiming to be the bread of life? I now know he spoke the truth. This is the story of how I came to know him through the breaking of bread. Father, Father, where are you? You won't believe it. I have to tell you everything. I'll burst if you're not home. Mother, it's the best thing in the world. It's better than a thousand pieces of silver. It's the very best thing that ever was. A thousand pieces of silver could come in handy. You won't believe it. I can't believe it. Wait till I tell you. Lucas, that's not the basket you left with this morning. No, it's one of twelve. The twelve amazing baskets. Oh, mother, father, where shall I begin? Suppose you come here and sit down first. Catch your breath. Here, here's a cool glass of water. Now, tell me as slowly as you can. Did you see the rabbi? Did I see the rabbi? Did I see him? 
I talked with him. He put his hand on my shoulder while, while his disciples counted the loaves of bread and fish you sent. He looked at me and smiled as if he knew. He did know. He had to know. He knew exactly what was going to happen before it ever did. He's amazing. Sip the water, Lucas. You're not making much sense. No. Here's how it happened. It was late in the day. I still had the loaves of bread and fish you sent for my lunch, Mother. You mean you didn't eat the lunch I packed for you? Lucas. I just got so caught up in with the rabbi, Jesus, that's his name, and what he was teaching, that before I knew it, the sun was going down, and I still had my lunch. But listen, I gave it to him. You must be starved, son. No, I can't hold another crumb. All of us ate as much as we could hold. And look, here's a basket of what was left over. Son, we are poor, yes, but we do not beg bread of others. No, it's our bread, all of it. It's the barley bread you baked this morning, Mother. You know, Lucas, that I only sent five little loaves and those two smoked whitefish with you this morning. Hardly enough for a boy your age, but... One more sentence, Mother. One more sentence, and you will be as amazed as I am. Very well. Jesus took those five loaves of bread and blessed them and started breaking them into pieces and hanging them out unto everyone there. They say there were 5,000 men alone, and every man, woman, and child on that hillside had their fill of bread you baked this morning. That's not possible. That's not my bread. That is the miracle, don't you see? You mean to say the bread in this basket... Leftovers of your bread, which he broke into pieces. Well, it tastes like my barley bread, but how? Mother... Father, would I tell you this if it weren't true? He used your lunch out of that whole crowd. My lunch alone. First the bread, and then the fish too. Will he be there again tomorrow? As if we could get to him, dear. That's the best news of all. Today, here's near Capernaum. That's why I'm home so late. But tomorrow, they say he's coming to this side of the lake. Here? To Bethsaida? Yes, and Father, he heals all the sick who come to him. Lucas, don't cook up false hopes. But Mother, one man had a withered hand, and when Jesus touched him, it straightened out, just like yours or mine. And the whole crowd shouted for joy. Anyone who touched him was healed of whatever sickness he had. But the crowds he gathers, how could I get to him among so many? And tomorrow is market day. I have food to buy, so I won't be able to help. Father... What if we borrowed Uncle Cleo's boat and rode right up to him? Uncle Cleo let us use it before. Your Uncle Cleopas may be at his homestead in Emmaus and not up here by the lake at all. We could at least check. Please, Father? <sighs> Lucas, it's one thing for a boy to run all over the countryside on adventures, but your father is not strong. Now, now, no more of that. I can see by the boy's eyes that I'll have to check on the boat at the very least. May I go with you? Stay here and help your mother. If I'm able to get to the boat, we'll have to get started before dawn, and you'll need your rest. I'm going with yours, Father. You'll see. You get some rest. Good night, son. Good night, Father. Lucas, I just hope you realize how hard this will be on your father when this all falls through. Now, I want you to get some sleep while I get the rest of this bread in the oven. But we don't need it. We have the basket full. We can't waste what I have here. Okay. Dear God, thank you for the bread. Thank you for Jesus. Help Father get to him. Bless Father and make him well. Bless Mother too and help her to understand. Bless Jesus in all the things he does. He is so kind and good and powerful. He is just like you. Amen. <laughs> Good job.
Lucas. Lucas, good morning. Morning, Mother. Come get your breakfast. Did Father get the boat? No, your Uncle Cleopas wasn't home. He must be down at Emmaus. Then Father won't get to Jesus. Here. Eat your bread and cheese. Mother, why don't we eat the bread I brought home yesterday? I don't trust it. Who knows where it came from? It's better to have our own. But Mother, Jesus blessed it. You'll do as you're told and eat the bread I baked last night. Where's Father? You'll be happy to know that his hopes were so high that this Jesus could heal him that he left in the middle of the night so he could walk to the lake by daybreak. He did? He's already gone? Yes. Mother, you have to come too. This will be the greatest day ever. I just know it will. Nonsense, Lucas. Someone has to go to market, and someone has to be here when you and your father come home and are crushed with disappointment. What if we're not disappointed? I'll believe that when I see it. Now your father said to look for him by the near side of the main dock. I'll have to take food again. I actually packed some loaves and fish for you both. But what about all this from yesterday? Is my bread not good enough for you? Yes, Mother. Thank you for the lunch. Now you just see that your father makes it home safe. What are you going to do with that basket? I don't know. Chase didn't see, Mother. It's good. Run along now, Lucas. You'll see, Mother. they where are they it's almost dark and no sign of them this is just what I feared would happen I knew this was a bad idea but who listens to the mother and all this bread this bread is foolishness maybe it'll do the birds some good is he here who father I thought he must have given up and come home he's not with you I never saw him by the near side of the dock or anywhere the crowds were even bigger today People everywhere. Oh no, and then he's fallen. He may be hurt. This is just what I feared would happen. We have to go look for him. Come in. 
Hello, Sarah. Hi, Lucas. Cleopas, we thought you were down at Emmaus. No one was at your house yesterday evening. Oh, I haven't been there for days. I've been following the rabbi around the lake. Oh? And what a day it's been. You should have come along. Oh, nonsense. There's been enough trouble as it is here. We were just Father's about to go. Father's crutch! Then you know where he is? Something's happened, hasn't it? Yes, something's happened, oh. but, but something wonderful. He wanted me to come in first to keep you from fainting away. So sit down. What is it? He's here. Father is here? Yes, look. What? Jesus has healed my leg! I knew a miracle! It. I just knew it. A miracle! This is the most wonderful day of yes. my life! Jesus of Nazareth has given me back my leg and my livelihood! How on earth did this happen? The rabbi put his hand on my leg and said that my faith had made me whole. Thank you. To throw down my crutch, and, and I did, and I can't explain it. I felt a warm rush of strength and energy into my twisted leg, and I, it was done. I could feel that it was as strong as the other. I knew he'd do it, Father. Yes, son, you knew. Thank you for your faith, too. Father, everyone's saying he's the Messiah. Until today, that is. Many of those who followed him for days turned and walked off. I, it was so confusing. The, the people from Capernaum, they were asking for manna from heaven, like, like back in Moses. And what he said to them was so strange. They thought he was confused by the heat, and, and I didn't understand it. And how did he put it? He said that he is the living bread come down from heaven, and that if any man eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And then he said that... The bread, the bread that he gives is his flesh, which he gives for the life of the whole world. And that's when they turned on him, though. Someone said, this is Jesus, son of Joseph. How can he say he came down from heaven? And then he said something about eating his flesh. Yeah, didn't he say something about um, if you... Everyone must eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood to have eternal life. Yes, that's yeah. it. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have eternal life. That stunned the crowd. Most of them walked away and left him standing in the field. What did he mean by all that, Father? I don't know, Lucas. I think the twelve that follow him, his disciples, I don't think they understood it either. Well, I have to believe he's the Messiah. He's given me back my leg and my livelihood, and I'll serve him until the day I die. And I don't know who he is, but I see what he's done. He must be sent from God. But what am I doing standing here when you men must be famished from walking all day? <laughs> yes, I have been walking all day, and what a blessing it is to have sore feet. I'll never complain of sore feet as long as I live. Come put me down. <laughs> Dear, can't you see we have guests? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cleopas, will you break bread with us? I'd love to. I haven't eaten all day. These are crumbs from yesterday. And it's still fresh. I have an idea. Let's go to the neighbors, all of them. We'll share our blessed bread with them. If this is a day for rejoicing, and I myself will carry the basket and serve the bread. This will be the most joyous day in the history of Bethsaida. Come and follow me.
Time does not permit me to tell you of all the things that have happened in the past two years since Jesus has healed my leg. But most strange are the events of the past week in Jerusalem. Events so horrible that they seem to prove once and for all that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. It was the Feast of Passover, and we decided to take Lucas down to Jerusalem for the great celebration. News was everywhere that Jesus was going to be at the feast as well. We were thrilled. I wanted to see him again and thank him again for what he'd done for me. And I did see him again, but not as I had wished. I witnessed his execution there at the public gallows just outside of the city. I don't know all the politics involved. I only know that I watched as those precious hands, those same hands that touched my leg to make it whole, were nailed to a wooden cross with iron spikes and his legs as well. Flesh and blood. Two years ago, Jesus spoke about flesh and blood. And this week, as I stood there and watched, his flesh was broken open and his blood flowed out upon the rocks below. He laid down his life. And I can't get that image out of my mind. I keep hearing the words he cried out on the cross. He asked God to forgive his executioners. Forgive them. And the look in his eyes. I've never seen such a look as I saw in his eyes. And I pray to God that I will never forget the precious image of the bread of life nailed to a cruel cross with nothing of hate, nor even anger in his eyes. Nothing but love.
Vegas. <sighs> Home. I'm so tired. I could fall asleep right here now. Put your things away first. Aww. When will father be home? Lucas, I told you not to ask that again. He had to stop by and see your uncle. Mace is a few miles out of the way, so he should be catching up with us by now. I didn't see him on the road behind us. Well, maybe he stayed the night with your uncle. Your uncle Cleopas seemed to take it all so personally. Your father did too. Mother? Yes, Lucas? What are we going to do with that basket? It's not much good anymore. The basket? I almost threw away the basket. And all that bread too. The first day you brought it home. But Lucas, no matter what has happened to Jesus, he gave your father back his health. And that basket, it was at the center of the happiest day anyone in this town has ever seen. But I don't want to keep it now. Well, we'll talk about that when your father gets home. Lucas! Lucas, where are you? I have to tell you everything. You won't believe it. Lucas, where's your mother? It's the best thing that ever happened. What is it, father? Oh, sit down, catch your breath. <laughs> Strange. This reminds me of that day two years ago. Oh, but another miracle has happened. What? Tell us, Father. It's Jesus. He's alive. Alive? I saw him. We both did. Your <laughs> uncle and I. He talked with us. He walked right beside us, and we never even knew it was him. <sighs> he, he asked us why we were sad. Can you believe he asked us that? He knew why we were sad. Oh, he was trying to get us to see, but we couldn't see past the noses on our faces. Dear, sit down. You're not making any sense. Take a drink. You know, you're making less sense than Lucas did when he brought home that basket. The basket? Where's the basket? How can he be alive, Father? He is, Lucas. I promise you he is. He's more alive now than ever before. Here, I'll tell you everything. This stranger who walked with Cleopas and me was telling us from the scriptures all about the Messiah. So many things seemed so clear as he explained them to us. How the Messiah had to suffer and die for the sins of the whole world. Oh, I have to read Isaiah again. And then we were on the road to Cleopas' house, and the stranger was continuing on his journey. But Cleopas insisted that he join us for supper. We continued talking as Cleopas got something ready, and then he got something on the table, and I first knew it was Jesus when he broke the bread. The bread. I can see his hands were torn or the nails had gone through. Oh, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bread come down from heaven. Then what? Then I don't know how, but he disappeared from our sight. Cleopas and I stared at each other for one long moment. Then we ran all the way back to Jerusalem to tell his disciples what we'd seen. Back to Jerusalem? But how could you be here so soon? I ran all the way on the blessed legs he gave me. And I'll keep on running from house to house in Bethsaida and Capernaum and anywhere else I can tell everyone I meet. This is what Jesus meant on the day that he made me whole. He is the living bread come down from heaven. And if any man eats of this bread, He'll live forever. It'll be just like that day we walked all over town with the basket of the bread that he blessed. Only this is, this is far better. This is the bread of life.
Do you enjoy that? Do they do a great job? Let's give them a hand, please. I will tell you that seeing it twice today, this morning, I was like, did they say that in the first? I didn't even hear that the first time. It really is. I mean, I think, you know, I'll start coming to, you know, both showings every year. That's a joke. I have to. You get it? I want to just thank those who are involved, and this is, uh, it's a lot of work to do this, but we want to really bring our attention to how Jesus is the bread of life. And uh, I struggle with my own spirit <clears throat> during these times in a couple of ways, and, and one of it, it is that I don't want to allow drama or people representing uh, Christ to take away the fact that he absolutely positively was the Son of God come down from heaven 2,000 years ago. He did everything that the Word of God says that he did. We try to remind you of these things, but this is not our tradition. This is not tradition. This is the truth. This is a person, the Son of God. And, and I think the best thing that I can do in closing out thoughts is to actually take you to John chapter 6, so if you take your Bibles, and take you actually to the passage that speaks of uh, this uh, analogy that the whole play represented, John chapter 6, that Jesus is that living bread. The analogy uh, that he is the living bread is that he was what was given by God come down from heaven. The background, as you already heard, Jesus had miraculously fed 5,000 people plus with five bar barley loaves and two fishes. And uh, at this time in history, Bread wasn't like we consider bread. We, we, you know, we go to Panera Bread and we have one of 400 choices about what kind of bread we want you know, with our bowl of soup on the side. Okay, during this time, the, the bread was daily bread that you needed to stay alive. You know, so you understand kind of in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It was basic sustenance that you needed to live. So when Jesus is talking about this, this goes in, into the analogy. So Jesus leaves the place where he did this great miracle, and he goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And realizing that their food source is gone, just like in the story, the people go to seek him where he went, to the other side. And they follow him and all, all around, and some on boats or whatever. And this is a background of what I'm about to read to you. And again, you know, God's word is where what Jesus said is the most important thing to see today. So I'm going to read to you several verses but I want you to listen to these verses and to realize this is Jesus speaking to you. That just as he talked to the crowd here in John 6, I want you just to imagine as I read this that he is talking to you and saying these things to you. right? Not for the sake of a cantata, not for the sake of a play. Jesus is saying, I am the bread to you. And so you need to understand, I need to understand what he means by that. So I'm going to read several verses, just listen as if Jesus was talking to you. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they, they said unto him, Rabbi, when, whence camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Basically, he says, the only reason that you're following me now is you want more bread. And then he says these incredible words, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth an everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed, or has given authority. Then said they unto him, uh, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They want to do miracles. They want to be part of this. Jesus said, answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. This is what you should do, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou uh, us then, that we may see and believe on thee? Uh, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Look up here. They're still trying to get bread from me. They don't care anything about the spiritual stuff that he's trying to tell them. They want stuff. They want, like, physical bread is what they want. Listen to what Jesus says. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth them life unto the world. Then said he unto them, Lord, or then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They still think he's talking about like, you know, wheat bread or barley bread. Jesus, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will that, that hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And of course, he was talking, to pe talking about people, that he would lose none of them that believed on him. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him. Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph, uh, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father which sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. <coughs> it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he that which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness. They're dead and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread, or the bread that gives life, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And I want you then to scan down to, to, to verse number 60. And I want to read these few verses so that you understand something that about, you know, I don't know how many millions of people don't understand. What Jesus was talking about was not, when he was talking about eating him, the bread of life, he was, they're not, he was not talking about communion, He's not a talking about like the bread, the wafer, and the juice becoming his literal physical body and, and his blood. We know that from these verses. Look at verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? <coughs> when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Or, you know, what will you think when I'm gone? It is the Spirit, Holy Spirit, that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. Now look at this. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They're spiritual words. I'm talking to you about spiritual things. And they are life. What's all this talk about bread? You know, we got bread everywhere. I don't know if you smelled bread when you first came in. There's actually bread out there. We're trying to get you to smell bread. You know, I was sitting here, the, the first service, I was sitting on the second row, and I could smell the bread, and I was hungry for it. I wanted, I wanted to have some bread. You know, as I said, bread to us is just nice with our dinner, but daily bread speaks of a basic need of food that we all have, uh, something that man cannot live without. We need our daily bread. The daily bread is the antidote for the starvation that much of this world has always experienced, people needing food. But bread also speaks of a hunger and a need to be satisfied within us, not just physically. It speaks of something we need, the reoccurring daily hunger that's in every man and every woman. And Jesus uses this hunger and desire for bread as a spiritual picture in this passage of every man's longing for the needs to live both satisfied here on earth and more importantly, satisfied in the next life. Now listen to me. If you live a very long life, you may live to be 90 or 100 years old. But you will live in eternity forever. You will live somewhere else forever. And so the idea is it's not enough for you to get enough in this life. You need to know what you need to do to have life in the next life. Every man and every woman needs more than they were born with spiritually. They need something outside of themselves. We look at amazing creation around us. And anyone that has any intelligence realizes that this just didn't come from nothing. There's someone, some great designer who made everything. We are aware of our own conscience all over the planet. People are aware of their own conscience within them, knowing that things, some things are right and some things are wrong. Not just here in America, in Afghanistan, in Iran, 
in, in, in Africa, Saudi Arabia, in India, in China. Everyone inside of them knows that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. How did that come? Why do we have that knowledge? We know there's something outside of us. We cannot truly be satisfied with our own mind, our own philosophies, and our own ideas of religion. They only get us as far as our own brain. And every person needs something beyond ourselves to bring spiritual life and eternal life to us. And there is only one thing that is that spiritual bread that will satisfy your soul in this world and the next. And that one thing is Jesus the Christ. And he is the answer to what is going on right now in your life and what will go on in your next life. In verse 26 and 27, if you look there at your Bible... Jesus exposes the hearts of these people who are just following him for physical bread. But isn't that so much like us? We care so much about what's going on right now and what food we have in the pantry and what money we have in our wallet and our 401k, what kind of car we're driving, what kind of house we have. We care so much about the physical things. We're missing it. He says, it is not even that you want the miracles anymore. You just want stuff. You want physical food. You want, your, you want what you want right now. And then he tells them something that may seem a little bit incompassionate in our benevolent society. He says, don't chase after the physical bread. Chase after spiritual bread that keeps on satisfying your hunger into eternal life. Folks, we have got to get our eyes off of this life. We have got to, we've got to get our, li- our eyes off of the fact that we want stuff in this world. There are things to be had. There's bread to be had that is much greater than this world. He says, God, Jesus said, I am the one that can give that to you. God the Father sent me to do it. I am the real deal. You notice he uses the word in verse 32, the true bread. He says, I'm not the fake bread. I'm not the stuff that satisfies you for a little bit. I am the true satisfaction. I am the one that can truly meet the needs of your heart. The hungers of your soul. I can provide you substance that will allow you to live forever. Physical things can't do that. Cars can't do it. Houses can't do it. Uh, Prestige can't do it. Intelligence can't do it. Beauty can't do it. Money can't do it. Only Jesus can do that. He is the true bread. What a claim. I told the morning crowd that either he is exactly who he said he is, God the Son come down to heaven as an ambassador, a mission to provide man, a bridge to God, to live with him, to be reconciled with him and live forever, or he's a crazy man. He's a crazy liar. There's no halfway with Jesus Christ. You can't sample Jesus Christ. He is who he says he is, and so we must give our whole life to believe on him and to follow him the rest of our life, or we must deny him. It can't be, it's got to be one way or the other. It can't be halfway. I want you to notice here in the passage that Jesus is the bread that God gave from heaven to eternally satisfy mankind. Look again at verse 32 and 33. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. He he means that God's the one who gave that to you. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he, he's talking about himself, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The people don't get what Jesus was saying in 26 and 27. They try the whole way through here, as I pointed out, that they want to just get more bread from him. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool, you know, when, G, when, when no one has anything but a little lunch, you know, and, and there's a little bit of food, and he feeds 5,000 people and 12 baskets beyond that. That's cool to see, and I don't fault these people because I'd like to see that again. I would like to see such miracles. But Jesus was pushing them to a stronger thing. He told them... Uh, you know, their forefather Moses that gave him that miracle bread in the wilderness called manna that would appear on the ground, whatever, that he was greater bread than that. Jesus says, you don't get it. Manna is not bread from heaven. I am bread from heaven. Manna sustained people on a daily basis. And if you know the Old Testament story, it just faded away. You know, the bread that's at home in your pantry or whatever on your counter, you're probably not going to be able to eat that bread next month. You know what I'm saying? That's a temporal kind of thing. Jesus is pointing out, I am not temporal. If you believe on me, I will satisfy your heart's needs and needs for salvation for the rest of your life and the rest of eternity. I am come to give eternal life. He even tells them in verse 49 that their fathers who ate that manna that they think is so wonderful are dead. You know, people need more than earthly stuff. People need more than what satisfies right now. See, every person ever born will, ever li- will live forever somewhere. And the way that the Bible works that out is you either live forever, 
and that means spend eternity with God because you've accepted Christ, or you will die forever in a place called the lake of fire. And the difference of where, whether you live forever or whether you die forever is what you do with Jesus Christ in this life. That is the difference between life and death. Look at verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus said that we must come to him and believe on him. You know, there are so many things that distract us. You know, you can read articles all about the gadgets and gizmos and how many people are just stuck on Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, if you go into any room or any airport or any, what, or any restaurant, you see people just stuck, you know, on their devices, whatever. So many things to distract us. So many things to take our mind off of the main thing. And I believe this is kind of what Jesus is saying here when he's saying, come to me. Turn away from other distractions. Open your eyes. Wake up. I am the real deal. Come to me and believe on me. And if you do, you'll never hunger or thirst again. As I said, it's obviously speaking of spiritual words, a spiritual hunger. That when we receive him by faith and believe on him, it's like eating him. It's consuming him. It's taking him in. We are becoming one with him. We are believing on him and trusting on him by faith, spiritual words. We must come to him and believe that he is our creator, that we have disobeyed. That from Adam and Eve, who turned away from God to disobey him, so every person sinned past to every one of us. But he was the savior who came to make everything right, to make a way of forgiveness and to be our Lord and our, mate and our master for the rest of our life. We as people try to do so many things, different things, to satisfy the hungers of our soul. Because, would you be honest with me, you need stuff, just like I need stuff in my heart. I want to know that someone longs and cares for me. I want to know that my life has meaning, and that there, I want to know what the meaning of life is. I need someone to take away the guilt of my sin that I know that I have done towards God. I need someone to comfort me. I need someone to help me in trouble. I need someone to love me and to guide my life daily. I need someone to be peace when I come to die. I need someone to calm my fears about what's going to go on in the afterlife. And that person is Christ. But we use so many other things to try to satisfy that. Everything from self-esteem to feel so good about ourselves to our careers to our talents and, and our self-worth of, of, uh, of trying to meet the satisfaction by the things that we have done or what we are. Maybe we find that, try to find that satisfaction in the bottle, in a bottle, whether that be an alcohol bottle or whether that be a bottle of pills. We try to dull our senses to the fact of what really our heart, our heart needs, our life meet needs. We try to meet those satisfactions with religion. And I want to tell you straight up, I'm going to be the first one to tell you that it's not the Baptist church that will get you eternal life. And it's not the Methodist church and it's not the Catholic church. What we preach at this church will cause you to find eternal life. But the tradition of coming and sitting in these red chairs won't do anything for you. And dressing up or acting a certain way will not do anything for you. It is only the Lord Jesus Christ that can satisfy the needs of your heart. And you can't quench that satisfaction with anything else. We come up short in the quiet places of the night when we put our head against the pillow and we consider that none of this has satisfied us. Jesus says only he can be that bread to satisfy us by coming and believing on him. He is the answer to every soul's need. A person, not a religion or a church. Jesus, the bread. Did you get the picture? Jesus, the bread, was broken for you on that cross. That's why he calls himself, or one of the reasons he calls himself the bread, because he was broken. He was torn apart for you. And they beat him, and they put a crown of thorns on his head, and they scourged his back, and they put iron nails through his hands and through his feet. Why was he doing that? He was your substitute. Look at this. He was doing it because of your sin. And all the way that I treated people last week and the bad thoughts that I had and the, the way that perhaps I was dishonest in some way, everything that I have done, everything you have done in the past and in the future of our lives, Jesus Christ was being punished for it. The wrath of God was poured out upon him. That's the whole deal. He was dying for eternity so that you could live for eternity. He is your substitute. And here is the real deal. The real deal about salvation and receiving the bread of life. If you will believe on him 
And you will admit your sinfulness before him. And you will believe that he died there on that cross for that reason. And he rose again to beat your sin debt. He will trade you for your sin. He'll take your sin and trade you his own righteousness. His own righteousness will be glued on top of you by God so that when God views you from that point of receiving Christ and on, you will forever be as righteous as Jesus Christ. Now that's a deal. And that is salvation. And whoever takes that bread, the great living bread, will never die. And the needs of their heart will be satisfied. And they will have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he that cometh unto me, as the scripture says here, I will no way cast out. You know what that means? He that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. It's somewhere in verse 37 through 40. He means this. Look, the best grandma here, the most moral person, to the worst sinner here, we're all, the, all at the a foot of the cross is level. We all need Jesus Christ. We are all sinners. And everyone that comes to him there is no way in the world that he'll turn you away. He'll receive you. He'll save you. It's a one-time decision where you believe that he was the creator come to die in your place. Come to give you his righteousness. Come to forgive you forever and ever. Believe on him. Take and receive the bread of life. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, as I said, there's no halfway. The Bible says... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I remember that July day of 1980 when I knelt by my sister's bed and I crawled out and asked Jesus to save me. It's a one-time decision where you are trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you take him as your Lord and Savior and you never turn back and you live for him the rest of your life. And because of believing on him, he takes away your sins, forgives you, and gives you his righteousness in place of your sin. That is salvation. So you have a decision, what you're going to do with all this bread. You have a decision to make, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? I want to give you an opportunity right now that you would call out and ask the Lord to save you. It's a decision by faith where you just call out and admit that you're, your sinfulness and you need to be saved. So I'd like you to bow your heads across the place. Our choir is going to sing a part of a, a song that they sang. There's no magic that is in the words that you say. It's not an incantation that you memorize. There's really no sinner's prayer in, in the way of repeating an exact thing. You just from your heart cry out and you tell God that you are a sinner and that you believe that his son really came to this earth and died on the cross and rose again for you. And you just say, God, please save me because of Jesus and what he did. Please save me. He already took my punishment for me. Please save me. You put it in your own words. The choir is going to sing right now. If you do not have Jesus as your Savior, call out right now in your own words, in your own heart, and ask him to save you. Jesus promised, he that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. He promised, whoever believes on him, that he would not lose even one of them. Every one that the Father caused to come to him, he would not lose one.
As your heads are bowed, just me and the Lord.